The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I should perhaps give a bit of an explanation of why I'm here this morning. I noticed that the kids heard I was preaching, so stayed away in droves. Uh, about 10.30 last night when I was doing some sermon notes, Andrew Spale sent me a text and he said, oh, Pastor Jim's not here today, so can you do the Sabbath school class? And I go, yeah, right. <laughs> and then later Andrew said, no, it's okay. I've arranged with Yana, she can take my class and I'll do the Sabbath school class. And then I said to him, look, here's another option. I'll do the Sabbath school class and you can take the sermon. <laughs> so we know what's happened which is why I'm here. Uh, I have to tell you today that this is not a new sermon. In fact, it was the first sermon I ever preached some 40 years ago at the Chinese church in Strathfield. Um, I should also add that it was also the last sermon that I was to preach there for whatever reason. Be that as it may, I acknowledge using the works of religious educators such as C.V. Garrett and G.F. Hassel, dictionary sources of Chambers, Macquarie, Webster, and I updated my material with thanks to Dr. Google. The last time that I preached, I used some 35 slides, PowerPoint slides, however. Today, I have cut that back and we'll only use two slides. And this is the first one, in case you were. <laughs> However, before we open the word of God this morning, let's just bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, you and you alone have the words of eternal life. And as we study and listen to you speaking to us, open our hearts and minds, we pray, so that your love will be revealed. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the title of my sermon, if I can get this up and running, yep, is The Love of God. This subject alone would probably take us uh, all of eternity to discuss, let alone comprehend. But it's not my intention to keep you here that long this morning. I'd like to approach the subject this morning by considering some tangible things of which we are all familiar, and from these, hopefully, gain a clearer insight, albeit so small or minute, of God's love for us. Uh, Jesus used a similar approach. In Matthew 13, verses 34 to 35, and if you've got your Bibles or tablets, you can turn to that. Normally, they would have it on the screen, but I was a bit lazy. Jesus spoke about all things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So you see this morning... I am probably not deviating from established theological principles. While I will use some familiar stories, it really is not about me or you or someone you may know. It's not about us, but about God and his overriding love for each one of us. Please note that in some of the stories that I will relate, I will use the fictional character that I will name Junior. Uh, my original sermon notes had young Johnny, but given that was some 40 years ago down the track, then referring to him to as young Johnny would not be appropriate. So it's going to be Junior. Okay. I would like to consider a subject familiar to all of us. Yes, boys and girls who aren't here, uh, included. And it's a subject of 
nagging. Now, I don't know whether you've heard too many sermons on nagging, but if you have, well, I apologize. Nagging is often thought to be the sole domain of the members of the fairer sex, the so-called nagging wife syndrome has been enough in itself to deter some young would-be male suitors from entering wedded bliss. Webster <laughs> makes an almost suicidal remark in defining nagging by referring to a person who nags, particularly a woman. Maybe Webster was having a bad day when he came up with that definition. However, with today's greater sexual equality, we would have to admit that males, on the rare occasion, nag as well. In fact, the spectrum is much broader than this. Parents nag children, children nag parents. Friends nag friends, teachers nag students. Yeah, ministers nag congregation and might I be so bold as to suggest we may even nag our pets. <laughs> you see, nagging is, a, is not a sex-linked characteristic at all. It's more than that. It's a personal problem, a character defect. It's a communication problem that ultimately breaks down a relationship. Nagging is defined as to find fault constantly, to bother or annoy by repeated urging, to worry or annoy continually. More clinically, however, it may be said that nagging is continuing to send out the message after that message has been received. In that respect, it is using undue or unfair means to transmit one's point. As someone has aptly put it, nagging may hit the nail on the head, but it continues to pound away long after the nail is in the board. Well, you're probably thinking here, okay. So how does nagging manifest itself? Nagging can take on various forms. So firstly, there are the generalizations, like you always, okay? you always. And I can imagine the wife in an argument in a one TV household going something like this to the husband. You always want to watch the football when Desperate Housewives is on. What's the opposite of you always is you never, that's correct. You never bring me flowers or chocolates on, and I can't say the words here, thanks to Jeff, the 14th of February. Right? So there's a spoiler alert there. Gentlemen, just be very careful if you decide to do something on the 14th of January, February, in bringing chocolates, you don't raise suspicion. Nagging can also come in case as an exaggeration. Thanks, Gary. Have you ever done this? If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, dog, don't bury your gar bones in the garden bed. Uh, and talking about, Kerry, I don't know whether you realised I did that to you this morning. We were talking about something and I said, if I told you once, I've told you a thousand times and you go, yeah, 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 right? Um, sometimes we do it automatically. And the next one, there comes the complete exasperation approach. How does that go? I'm sick and tired of your whinging. Or I give up trying to understand you or you were just one impossible person to live with. Also, sometimes our nagging comes in the form of a rhetorical question. 
Are you ever going to learn, dog, not to bury your bones in the garden? Or to round it out, sometimes there's just plain old sarcasm. You are just as stubborn as your mother. <laughs> and there is, of course, the unfair comparison. Your sister wouldn't do a thing like that. Or Junior, why aren't you good? Why aren't you as good in English like Mrs. Shakespeare's son, William? <laughs> now, if one of the above is bad enough, imagine the effect of a combination used in a situation. Consider the case of a mother chastising her errant young son who was caught doing something considered dangerous. And what does she do? She says to him, are you completely stupid like your father? <laughs> Here we have the unfair comparison, the exaggeration with sarcasm thrown in for good measure. It's the old three-in-one trick. So where do we go, or what do we do here? Now, as I said, not only is nagging detrimental to a relationship, it's also self-defeating to a relationship. And each one of us is equipped with our own defense mechanism against nagging. Um, and what do you think the chief de defense is what? What do we do? We tune out. We tune out. Consider what happens when the first party sends out a message repeatedly or unduly. Usually, the second party tunes out. When the second party, be it husband, wife, friend, child, or dog, tunes out, the first party tends to what? Transmit their message louder. Louder. And why do you think we do this? You see, there's a human tendency to mistake louder for clearer. And let me uh, demonstrate this point. There was an old lady at the Chinese church whom, you know, I tried to communicate with. She would shout at me in Chinese which I don't understand. And I, in turn, would shout back into, to her in English, which she didn't understand. You see, apart from the fact that we both may have been a little deaf or hard of hearing, we worked on the premise that volume will destroy the language barrier. I don't know whether you've ever been um, around and someone has asked you for directions. And I once remember a young Japanese couple asking me the way to the opera house. Uh, this was in the days before mobile phones, GPSs and so on. And in thinking about it, yes, I did speak louder than I normally would as I tried to explain which direction that they had to go. When they started heading off in the opposite direction, I realised that I had to take another approach, you know. Uh, it was a case for action. So what I did, I took them down through some of the back streets of the rocks, opposite to where they were going or where they thought they should be going, until they could see the opera house. Uh, and it wasn't until then that they probably started breathing normally again. <laughs> After then, there was a lot of sayonaras and arigatos and bowing and scraping and, and all that as, as it happens. Um, and you may have done the same thing when someone, a foreigner, asks you for directions. You may find yourself talking that little bit louder than you normally would. So back to the scenario. What happens when the shouting begins is that the second party tunes out even further, perhaps yeah, completely turning off the receiver. This in turn causes the first party to shout 
even louder or talk more and more and become frustrated. And the ultimate result is that each resents the other for making them become the kind of person that they don't like being. That's why I suggested earlier that nagging is a communication problem that ultimately breaks down relationships. And it doesn't need to be like this, however. Consider this following scenario. At the dinner table, young Junior knocks over a glass of milk. It was an accident, but nevertheless, the milk spills on the tablecloth and the glass breaks. Mum squeals, my beautiful tablecloth that I just bought from Kmart. Dad yells, you clumsy clot. And even little sister thinks it's a grand opportunity to throw in her 10 cents worth with, yeah, you got fat fingers, Junior. <laughs> the, the frightened child apologizes. It was, after all, an accident. The milk is sponged up, the glass is cleared away, and a new glass of milk is poured and offered to Junior, but with the proviso, now this time, don't spill it. To me, that statement is nagging. All that has happened has told the child that the spilling of milk at the table creates an unpleasant experience for all concerned. An apology has been rendered, therefore, this verbal redundancy, now this time, don't spill it, is nagging. Even a simple statement such as, here's another glass of milk, teaches the child that a scorekeeping process is going on. Maybe the three strike policy applies. Or how about the 70 times seven? Now, if it was the latter case, that would certainly require a lot of milk. Anyhow, the child soon comes to realize that milk, once spilt, cannot be truly sponged away, sponged away. Now, let us suppose that for illustrative purposes, the following happens. The milk is wiped up, the broken glass is disposed of, and the tablecloth replaced. Mother then turns to Junior and asks, Junior, would you like a glass of milk with your meal? This question, asked as if for the first time, could teach a child that mistakes of apologise for can be truly sponged away. You see, we tell our children, this is what happens with our sins. How much easier it is for them to grasp if they have some reference point at home. Yet, that is the way that God deals with us. And why can't we do the same with one another? If you've got your Bibles, let's look at 1 John 1 verse 9. One John one and most of you will know this off by heart. It says, "If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to purify or to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all unrighteousness." Hebrews ten, verses sixteen to eighteen says. The Holy Spirit, sorry, uh, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. I will remember no more. And lastly, Isaiah 44 Isaiah 44 and verse 22. I have swept away your offences like a cloud. 
Your sins like the morning mist return to me, for I have redeemed you. There is a good example of God's love as demonstrated in the story of Jonah. Many years ago, Jonah missed the boat, so to speak. Instead of going to Nineveh, he decided what? To go to Tarshish. And in the interim, he had a whale of a time, if you'll excuse the pun. After floundering in the boat and in the sea, Jonah changes his course in more ways than one. When he gets back to land, humbled and exhausted, we have the record in Jonah 3, verses 1 and 2. So if you've got your Bibles, Jonah 3. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Mara, something or other, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. So Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And verse 2, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, if you were listening very carefully at our scripture reading, it says in Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, Go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it because of its wickedness that has come before me. And you know, these, the text in Jonah 3 verses 1 and 2, is, uh, they're probably the most beautiful in the Bible. And some of you may be asking why. And if you look carefully in the, instruction, in the instructions in that chapter, they're exactly the same as in chapter 1 verse 2. And you see, that's what makes it so beautiful. You see, God didn't say as, as we might, well, Jonah, get down to Nineveh and don't blow it this time. Or we might use exaggeration. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Yeah. Now, if that didn't work, how about a comparison? Jonah, why can't you do as you were told like my other servants, Moses and Elijah? Or we might pose the rhetorical question, Jonah, what words in go to Nineveh don't you understand? And then lastly, sarcasm to round out the nagging process, Jonah, how long can you tread water? No, there's no record of that whatsoever. Jonah had repented and God, what? Had forgiven him. Therefore, the instructions were stated as if for the first time. And also Jonah's obedience was accepted as if for the first time. For with God, this time is always the first time. We have a loving Heavenly Father and our response is one of loving him because he first loved us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, and we know this verse. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 16 says, and we know and rely on the love God has for us. And in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. You see, God's love for us and through us will be manifested to others. That love will strengthen relationships, which is completely different to nagging, which 
breaks down relationships. Loving and nagging are compatible, not compatible. Our assignment is to live love, and when we attain to that state, the difference, I'm sure, will be noticeable, be it by husband, wife, child, friend, workmate, and might I suspect that even the dog will notice the difference. In closing my sermon today, just hold on, can't find it. Um, I'm going to read a prayer from a little book called A Common Prayer by Michael Looney. Um, this, this came in the mail to me recently this week. A, valued, um, a dear friend and valued church member, who shall remain nameless for at least a few seconds, sent this to me. Thank you, Claudine, for your kindness and your support in the little things, and that's why we appreciate you and we love you. This is Loon. Love one another and you will be happy. It's as simple and difficult as that. There is no other way. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Father, we are prone to leave the love of God, but this morning we pray that we'll respond to the warmth that your love gives to each and every one of us. Help us to build up relationships. Help us to spread your love to those around us in the world in need, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.